It is the laborer's strength. How could he preach the gospel? How could he bend his knees in prayer? How could the missionary go into foreign lands? How could the martyr stand at the stake? How could the confessor acknowledge his master? How could men labor if that one word were taken away? God with us is the sufferer's comfort, is the balm of his womb, is the alleviation of his misery, is the sleep that God gives to his beloved, is the rest after exertion and toil. God with us is eternity's sonnet, is heaven's hallelujah, is the shout of the glory, is the song of the is the chorus of angels and is the everlasting oratorio of the great orchestra of the sky. God with us. God with us. Our scripture lesson is familiar because Sarah just read a good part of it again. <laughs> but I wanted to share about God's love as we celebrate the fourth candle of Advent and also the Christ candle, which we will light tonight. Scripture lesson is from 1 John, the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 7. And think of this and how John has interwoven several practicalities from God's love to us and how we're supposed to love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who do not, does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has sent for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, 
but perfect love <coughs> casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If love says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Let's pray together. Lord God, as we think about the coming of Christ and this fourth Sunday of Advent, we think about your love for us, first demonstrated through you giving your Son to be our Savior. As we think of love and we think of Christ coming to earth, bless us and help us to love others as you've loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we have lighted the fourth candle, the candle of love, and also we'll talk about the Christ candle and light it this evening. God's love for us in sending his Son to be our Savior can't be separated from three theological facts. The virgin birth, illustrated in Matthew, we know a lot about the virgin birth and but in Matthew's Gospel, the first chapter, the angel announces to Joseph, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned her to send her away secretly. But when he, and he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for Christ, who has been conceived in her, is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So we have the truth spoken by the angel to Joseph of the virgin birth. The second truth, theological truth, that, that this passage talks about is the pre-existence of Christ. And if we look further back in John's Gospel, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being. And we see that truth in our scripture lesson today, as well as the first chapter of John's Gospel. The third thing we see in the 14th verse of John 1 is the Incarnation. How did God send his Son? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see these great, three great theological truths of the virgin birth, the pre-existence, and the incarnation illustrated in our scripture. This practically leads to four more principles woven into this text. And I say woven in because it's not straightforward like a three-point outline. But the truths we'll observe in the text are these. God loved us first and sent his Son to be our Savior. In verses 9 and 10 of our scripture lesson, by this, the love of God was manifested to us, that God has loved us, has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So God loved us first and sent his son. John 3, 16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for us. He loved us that much. The third principle we see is, or excuse me, the second part of the second principle is this. Jesus came to be our Savior and also the propitiation for our sins. A couple of chapters over. In 1 John 2, 2. Beginning with the end of verse 1, if anyone sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And Jesus Christ the righteous, he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then in our text, And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So, John makes a point in this chapter, first of all, that God loved us first, that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, for our Savior, Jesus also, during his time on earth, has demonstrated what love looks like. It talks about it in this chapter and also in 1 John, the first chapter. John begins this letter by telling us what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, when we have looked at it and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifest, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship was, the Father, was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So the third thing that's illustrated in this passage is Jesus, during his time on earth, demonstrated how we're to love one another. He gave us a pattern for Christian love and how we are to treat one another. And the fourth principle we see is two things again. There's no fear in this life, fear of the future, we have confidence in verse 17, and there's no fear in the judgment day. And the other principle that goes along with this, in our daily lives as we live on this earth, there's no fear of separation from God's love. And the book of Romans talks about that. Romans the eighth chapter concludes after many things, uh, the descriptions of what he says, he didn't spare his own son, but delivered him over for us. How will he not also with him give us freely all things? And the passage ends in verse 38 and 39, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor depth, nor height, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from God's love, which is in Jesus Christ. So four things that are illustrated in our text today. God loved us first and sent his son to be our savior. Jesus came to be our savior and gave his life 
as a propitiation for our sins. We have seen love demonstrated. We know what love looks like because Jesus lived on this earth and lived the life of love. And there's no fear of us for us in this life or the next because the love of God has been manifested through his son, Jesus Christ. John's gospel is written in a pretty straightforward way. It's us, all the gospels, really. But John tells the story of Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection in his gospel. The epistles of John are somewhat um, written differently. Recently, we studied John's epistles in our Wednesday Bible study, and uh, you've heard the term circular argument or circular reasoning. Well, this isn't really what John is doing in the epistles, but he does have a habit in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John of going back over the same material and circling back. He'll go from one subject to another, circle back, and then talk about the first thing again. The two main truths of 1st John that he talks about is teaching the truth about Jesus mainly, but about other things, living victoriously through Jesus Christ and the love which Jesus has shown us during his time on earth and that we are to love each other as Jesus taught us to love all men. So let's go back and look at our text and this won't be orderly like it's a three-point outline but it will go in the order of the text as we look over it this morning. John, John opens in verse 7, open this line of reasoning by saying, God is love, and if God is love and has shown us love, ought we not to love one another? And in verse 8, if we don't love one another, and this is a sobering thought, we can't be of God. Now it's hard, it's easy to love some people, people we care about, our spouses, our children, uh, people we really have a lot in common with and we like to be around, but other people, it's sometimes harder to love. Let's just be honest, there are people that are hard to love. But nevertheless, real, Biblical love is something we need to practice with all the people we're around because Jesus has shown us what that means. By this, the love of God was manifested to us. This is how God brought this to pass. God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. How do we live through Jesus? What does that really mean? And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Not only did God send his son to earth to be our Lord and Savior and what Jesus accomplished, but also Jesus' time on earth taught us how to love other people. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Beloved, now John challenges us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. When you stop and think of all that our God has done for us, in all that Jesus accomplished during his time on earth, his life, his death, and his resurrection, does that make it a little more understandable how we can love others that we may disagree with, we may not think in our own self so highly of, but if we come to understand what God has done for us, we have the ability to love others because 
we abide in him. By this we know these, these things, if we abide in he, him and he in us, he has given us the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in our lives to enable us to love the unlovely. People we might not in our natural man care about being around or care about doing things for because we understand what God has done for us in sending his son to be our savior. We are able to love others. We have seen in verse 14 and testify that the father sent his son to be the savior of the world. And that term is used also in Matthew 1, 21. Jesus came to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. We must know the truth and accept the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. It's part of what it means to be a Christian. We've come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in God's love, God abides in him. It's a relationship, and if we sever, try to sever that relationship, or if we're not abiding in the things of God, we're not going to be able to love others. But by abiding and staying, in a relationship with our Heavenly Father, this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. So it not only applies to our relationships in this life and how we love others, it applies to our life in the future. This love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. There's no fear in love. If you've experienced God's love and you're living in God's love, you don't have to be afraid of anything in this life. Perfect love casts out fear, and nothing can separate us from God's love. And then it leads back around to the first principle in verse 19. We love because he first loved us. We wouldn't know how to love we, if we hadn't experienced the love of God in our lives and understand what it means for Jesus to come and give his life for us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen can't love God whom he has not seen. So, reasoning, if you can't love your brother who you've seen and be with, how can you claim to love God? And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So, understanding what God has done for us in sending his son to be our savior, what Jesus was willing to do to leave his heavenly home on I to come to earth to give us a pattern for living and ultimately die for our sins, to be the propitiation for our sins, and to give his life, and then to raise again. All of these principles are interrelated. God gave his son. The son came and taught us how to live this life and how to love others. And in the future, those who have loved others and demonstrated God's love have an eternal hope with Jesus and the Father when Jesus comes again. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven, heaven's greatest joy, came to be our incarnate deity and live among us. May God bless us as we think about these things this morning. Thank you.